really far away from you. I know. I feel really far from you, too. Well, I want to make sure this is featured <laughs> prominently. Awesome. So um, I'm Esther, the founder and CEO of Olabot. Olabot um, is a platform for making personal bots specifically on Messenger right now. Um, and I'm joined by Matt, who is actually one of my investors. Um, he's a partner at Betaworks. And I'd love it if you just shared a little bit about what Betaworks is all about. Sure. So uh, at Betaworks, we do two things. We build companies from scratch. Uh, so we start companies in our what we call the studio. And then we also make uh, seed stage, very early stage investments in outside companies. And the thing that's consistent across all of them is our area of focus is broadly at the intersection of technology and media, but more specifically around kind of the evolving ways that people communicate. Great. So conversational interfaces, um, we did like a quick poll and it seemed like not very many people knew much about conversational interfaces. Um, so I wanted to start with asking you to just sort of define what that means. So, so when we think about conversational interface, when we, that word sort of like, we're trying to figure out how to describe the thing we're thinking of, which is the evolving way that people are talking to their computers. And that might mean, literally speaking, it might mean texting. And there's sort of, I, I kind of view it as this longer arc, but like in, in the current terms right now, it's things like um, administrative uh, assistance that are automated and you can chat with on text or the, um, I don't know if you all, do you all use Slack? Anybody use Slack in their office? Um, there's like the little bots on Slack that you can chat with to be able to uh, run a process or to be able to set up a meeting. Sometimes there's a bunch of new bots. And uh, Facebook has now opened those up. Um, there's, so, so when we think about conversational interfaces, the starting point is the ability to talk with computers in a different way. And then our kind of overarching view is that the, interfa the, the interfaces that are around us are changing and opening up. And so we're going to have the ability to um, have new kinds of software to interact with them. Yeah, so kind of like jumping off of that, the way I think we talk about it a lot in the office is around two different categories of conversational interfaces. There are the voice assistants, ones like Alexa um, or Siri, and then there are the chatbot-based ones, ones like Olabot or um, M, if you're familiar with Facebook's um, chatbot. <laughs> uh, and there are kind of two types of, types of chatbots right now, like the ones that are purely text-based, where you can have sort of free-form messages, and then the ones that are really structured messages. So you can push buttons. Um, those are really in platforms like WeChat, especially. Um, I'd love to hear like your thoughts on the structured messages versus free-form. What are like, the pros and cons of both of those? Sure. So um, have, you, have any of you used, do you know what Esther's talking about in the context of kind of uh, WeChat? You can go into individual apps almost inside of the chat application. Have you, some of you have seen that. Some of you are nodding your heads. Um, so our, the way that we look at new companies, we're very, very product focused. And so one of the things we've been digging into is trying to figure out how whatever the thing, is, whatever the interaction is that you're doing is native to that platform. So if you happen to be sitting at a screen and looking at something where buttons make sense, then we would argue that you shouldn't necessarily make it harder for people to interact with your app by having sort of mediocre natural language processing. Um, at a, as a totally other extreme, one of the examples I use sometimes is, uh, is Uber. People talk about, because everyone kind of knows what that product is, um, the people, right now there's an app, right? So they have a GUI, like a graphic user interface that, uh, that you can press a button on. But I don't, have you ever tried, people talk about like the Uber app in Facebook or Uber app in Alexa. And the thing that's not such a good experience is texting your entire address to a place when you could just open up your phone or your watch and press a button, which automatically is sending your latitude and longitude exactly where you are. You have to do almost nothing. Um, one of the things I think is interesting about like the Alexa app is that people can, it knows where it is. So you say, Alexa, order me an Uber, and it just works. Because it has, your, the Alexa doesn't move. But if, it were, if the Alexa were something that moved around, that interaction wouldn't work as well. And you might go back, going back to your sort of original question, you might need buttons because you need to be able to ask a specific question. Do you want to do Uber X or do you want to do um, uh, the pool or do you want to do the big SUVs? <laughs> right. So how did we get here? Like, what is it that's happening that's unique right now? There's a lot of talk about 
this year, 2016, being the year of conversational commerce, conversational interfaces, like why now? What's happened with technology? Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a few things that are converging now and we're like a little bit early for it, but you can start to see different points, uh, pieces coming together. So we did a study um, in 2014 on what, home, what people, apps people had on their home screens. So this will be a long answer, but I'll get there. And what we found, and we actually released an app called Home Screen that let you, uh, let you take a screenshot and we tracked all the apps. You're talking about 50,000 uh, apps across, I think, 40,000 people or so. So it was a decent sample size. It was mostly early adopters. What we found was that out of the 50,000 or so apps we tracked on people's home screens, 900 of them were on more than one person's home screen. So like 49,000 and change, like one person just happened to have this app. They found it randomly in the app store. And if, I'm sure that if you look at the, the, the home screen of the person who's next to you, you probably have mostly the same apps. You have like Instagram and a mail app and a phone app and texting and it's not, they're not that different. There might be one different app. What that means for developers is that it's really, really hard to get people to find out about your app. So you have all these people building things. I mean, I've heard numbers like 50,000 apps are submitted. It must include software yeah. updates, right? <laughs> uh, to the app store every month. Yeah. So like you're making your, you're like coding, 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 and then you like put it out there and then nobody downloads it or if someone downloads it for a second and deletes it and, right? Yeah, yeah, and all the effort that goes into that. Right, so, right. so think about all of the things you have to do over the six months, year period when you plan to write that, that, create that product and then you put it out there and, and it's really, really hard. You have a whole other set of challenges around marketing. So we were looking at that and we started to say, well, what's, what's one layer ahead of the home screen? It's, you know, the notifications layer on your phone? So the tray that comes down that has like, you have a text from this person, you have a Facebook message, whatever it is. Um, we started looking at that layer as a place, what if you could just build an app that lived only there? Like there's no home screen app. That actually is like the main engagement point. And we made some, we started to make some investments, build some stuff around that, look up d deeply into that. And one of the things that turned out was that most people have social media apps as what, what alerts them. Because you don't really want apps bothering you. You want like your friends bothering you, right? That's who you want to give access to. So why now? So what happened was a bunch of the social media products, really starting with Slack, um, let developers start to create just messaging bots. So what that means is you already have the Facebook Messenger on there. You have the ability to send a push notification because Facebook does. And then Facebook it opened up uh, services. So we built an app, uh, a Facebook Messenger app called Poncho, which is just a weather service that message you twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, with customized weather for where you are and some information about traffic, depending on if you drive or if you take a subway. And they didn't actually need to, you don't need the app, there's no, there's, there's no app. It's just the interface is this conversation that you're having with the bot. So that's kind of the first part. And then the second thing is natural language processing, which is, I think, a little bit further behind. I don't know, what do you think about natural, you, you, yeah. you deal with this a lot. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely, for us, something we've played around with. Um, so natural language processing, it's the ability for a computer to parse out what you're saying. What are the intents behind what you're saying? Um, it, it's actually really, really challenging. And so what we've basically fallen back to and what the best practices uh, ac really across the industry right now, like, you know, the head of Facebook's messenger platform is saying, structured messages still really are kind of the way to go for now because it's really challenging to understand what someone really wants. And what you, can you describe what you mean by structured messages? You said a little bit before. Yeah, yeah, so a structured message is just like a button, a button that you push. Um, so an example might be if you're like sort of the quintessential um, uh, example is always ordering pizza. So you want to order a pizza, you text, um, you know, Domino's through their messenger app, and you'd say something like, I want a, you know, I want a large pizza. And then they're going to ask you what toppings, and they may give you some buttons to push. Like, do you want some cheese? Okay, cheese. Do you want extra cheese on that? Instead of typing all of that out, you can actually just interact with it through buttons or maybe through photos, videos, um, things like that. I mean, one of the interesting things about that is it's all about what the potential solution set is. So if you have a handful of choices and they're really long to type, let people, buttons make sense. But when you start to think about the world and like we call it deep linking, but if you think about the really long URLs that are like impossible to type and then you end up with like these menu bars with navigation all over the place, like I don't even know all the features that are in like Google Docs. Yeah. And so, you, I don't know, if, for those of you who have Macs, you can just type, you can go to help and just do a search. And it'll show you the, which, like, which button you should drop down to. That's kind, of, that's kind of what we're talking about. It's like a very kludgy way to do it. 
you're pressing help, you're typing in, you're actually having, a, I mean, it's only a one-way conversation, but you're typing something in and it's finding the right thing and bring it to you. I mean, really what it should do, in my view, is you type it in, it just does the thing, like bold this paragraph should just do that. I don't have to go to, to highlight it and select it and go over there. Right, right. I mean, Alexa is kind of an interesting example of this where you have to still use particular voice commands. So you can't just sort of talk to Alexa like a person. You really have to give her the commands that she recognizes. And if you don't, you go off the rails and she can't do anything for you. So that's kind of, we're in this interim period still. Um, I was going to say one other thing that might be interesting to note about why now with conversational interfaces is the change from social networks being the primary place people are hanging out to messaging apps being the primary place people are hanging out. So just last year, this convergence happened where now people spend more time on messaging apps, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, iMessage, all these places. Um, so I would love to hear, like, what do you think um, are some of the big challenges that come up in this space? I mean, one of the things that is sort of a, 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 like a corollary to all of this is that if you, if you have to initiate a conversation, you don't know what the choices are of what the thing can do, right? So like I have, I think now, 50 skills I've installed on my Alexa, I don't remember them, and so they basically don't exist to me. And so the, the developers have to start to think about what the repeat use behavior is so that you start to learn about that. Um, and I think that the second thing is just pe people are, it's so early that people don't know how to deal with, you, users aside, developers don't know what users want in terms of should we be, like what, if you ask it a question it doesn't know the answer to, like what should it do? Like should it make a joke? Should it be like, I don't know the answer to that? Should it refer you to another chat bot that, uh, that does know the answer? I mean, what, you've been sort of building very deeply in this space. What are some areas that you think are, are challenging? I think one of the challenges is around voice for these bots. So thinking about the the persona that it's um, that it, it creates. So um, what what are the naming conventions? Do you, how do you deal with gender? How do you deal with culture? How do you infuse empathy? Because you're having a conversation with a machine, but this machine has to feel like something. And and so how much do we anthropomorphize these interactions? I mean, I think we don't know. So there are, are, you know, we're testing things out along the spectrum of whether this should be in the, in the voice of a human, of a, of a cat, <laughs> uh, like Poncho, um, or some, you know, other type of creature. Um, I think those are some of the questions that are really interesting to me in this space. Uh, yeah, I'll make one other comment on that, and then maybe we should, if, if you, do you all have, think about a question maybe, if you want to. Um, but uh, we built this company, we built this product called uh, Giphy, which is a search engine for animated GIFs. So you type in, um, you type in like happy or excited and it responds with like a person jumping around or like happy dance or whatever. And one of the things that's interesting is that most of the search terms are not the same search terms you would type into Google, they're emotional search terms. It's like, it's a lot about how you feel and uh, GIFs as a file format are not particularly efficient as a way to communicate your emotion, they're actually much more efficient than describing it. And so one of the things that we think about... Like in, stickers. What? And stickers. <laughs> right. Because it, it turns out that stickers are just uh, transparent <laughs> gifts. Fair. Um, but yeah, so exactly. So so, so much of, of these conversations that regular people, that humans are having with, with each other, involve these kind of other, th these other media types. And to your point, I think, how does a... Uh, you know you're communicating with a robot. Is that good? Is that bad? Should it acknowledge it? Uh, or should it, uh, should it just sort of not have a personality? And I think we've seen right now even when you look at Siri to Alexa to you know, my, uh, the example of Pancho, the, the weather cat, they have a very, very wide range, range of, uh, of, of personalities or lack thereof. Yeah. Okay. I see some hands going up. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, how do you see augmented reality or Pokemon Go in uh, impacting the conversational interface paradigm? Um, in a way, I do. I mean, I think there's two interesting things to me about Pokemon Go. One is that people actually used it, which is awesome, right? People now understand, like, some in some sense, you could be like, "This is Pokemon Go for this." And you're like, "Oh, now I understand what it it's is." It's so massive. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, the fa aside from the fact that it got people 
up out of their behind their desks and and going places. But um, the the connection point there is when we're kind of looking five years out, ten years out. Someone earlier was talking about virtual reality, augmented reality. Are there going to be uh, how do, what do apps look like inside of those worlds? Like. Is it an app store or is it I'm sitting here and I have my glasses on and there's like a thing over there that I can engage with or not and that's an app. And so, and then how do you engage with it? Yeah, well I was gonna say like, I mean, places like China are a little bit ahead of us in this way because of QR codes, which never really took off here, but they are so popular in all over Asia and so you can have this mix of like real world uh, life interacting then in a virtual way so you can, you know, transact with commerce um, through QR codes and all kinds of things, especially in WeChat, that w haven't really manifested here. But it'll be really fascinating to see how, yeah, there's the, going to eventually be this mix between reality and, uh, and the virtual world. Yeah. I mean, people communicate with voice. And I think that in AR and VR, voice seems like a very, very native way to be able to issue commands if you're by yourself. It's probably pretty weird if you're like walking around and like yelling at things, but um, so, so I, do, I think that that's a, a huge piece of what the interaction will look like long term. Yeah, what? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was chatbots, people, they're pretty novel right now. So people are willing to put up with more shit they normally would. What are the limits of that? I have to answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I agree. They're to part of the reason that there, there's like a, one thing that's happening here is that there just aren't that many chatbots. And I think people want to build for that area because you can get people to, to try them out because there's just, they are novel. Um, what, what and because you don't have to go through the app store. Right. They're server side, they're fast to build, they're easy to deploy. So, uh, no, to I totally agree with that. The, I'll tell you a couple of challenges that I think that people are running into. Um, the, one of the early design paradigms that I've seen se it seems to work is you push, push notify people once a day and then wait for them to respond. So there's a few apps that do this. There's an app called uh, Shine, which is a text message service. Um, it's, it's kind of like a, a life coaching almost. It gives you advice. And you can respond M for more. And I think they do a really good job with that. Um, another example is a company called Digit, which sends you your bank account balance once a day. And you can respond with recent for recent transactions or balance. But the idea there is, if I, I, I almost always look at it. And I think people are, if you send them one message a day, one or two messages a day in a regular way, they feel totally comfortable ignoring it. But then that third or fourth time where they actually want to follow up, um, then they, then they have the ability to do it. They're sitting right there in the chat interface. And if they think, so now I've actually moved, we're not invested in digit. I just think it's awesome. Well, I don't open my bank. Uh, I, bank I love digit. Much. I just got, I just hit my $5,000 saved with them totally not even trying. So, and, and <laughs> that's great. I, I, I was really proud of that. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the content not to like plug digit randomly, but <laughs> what it does is it happens to live in the text, in the text message as a text message service, but it, uh, automatically sees how much you're spending and tries to like siphon off a little bit to save for you, which is a cool, a cool service. I just like it because I think the interaction is better than my bank app where I have to like open it up and, and type my password and like tap 10 different times to get like my last three recent transactions. Yeah, love them. Um, I'll just add one quick thing to that, which is um, I, I think one of the limits is around re-engagement. If you don't actually feel like it's adding value, and I think a lot of chatbots, frankly, don't add very much value yet, then you're going to give up on it. And unfortunately, for a chatbot, if you, bla if you block it, it's like game over. And, uh, and you can block them so easily. So I think that's going to be a, a pretty big challenge. Yeah. I actually, how much time do we have left? One more question. One more question. OK. The 
the question was uh, for e-commerce startups that are wanting to use bots, is that what you're, or conversational interfaces in general? Exactly. Okay, so for e-commerce e companies wanting to use uh, conversational interfaces, what are um, the best practices? Yeah, I mean, I think, think e-commerce is a very broad category, but there's a bunch of examples of people who are doing this even before we were sort of all talking about chat interfaces with humans. So one category is um, uh, giving people advice on what they should buy. So you have a company operator now where you can say, I'm looking for this particular thing, and you just type it in, but there's a human on the other side, and that's kind of how they I think they might have some scripts, but there's a person there trying to figure out what it is, making suggestions for you. I'm sure they have something on the back end that's tying together and making recommendations for the person answering, but it's a, it's a human. And I, I think, um, in, like in any industry, there's, if you, as you break down e-commerce into a bunch of different categories, some of them feel like they make a lot of sense. When you're at the top of the funnel, they were talking about earlier, kind of the top of the funnel versus knowing exactly what you want. Um, I can see, I can see uh, w when you want advice, that is a conversation. You're having a conversation back and forth. I think when you want to pick something, I'll use a counter example, which is um, I've, I've tried a bunch of products that, are, uh, that help you book flights. And describing what I want in text is not particularly, it's not nearly as good as just going into Kayak and using their like little like, here's where I want to go, here, give me the drop down. There's not that many choices, but it's actually really hard to describe. Say, I want to go to this particular place on Friday, but I'm willing to go a little bit early, maybe between eight and 10, and don't want to spend more, it's, like, why not just have buttons? And so I think the, the most, one, some of the most interesting products right now are the, because the natural language isn't there and, and are ones that, that, are, that are hybrids. Yeah, and I'll just add, um one little last thing to that, which is right now I think for e-commerce sites that are playing with messaging, there's a recognition that this is a concierge kind of service because you really do need a person on the back end to ensure that it's a quality interaction. As a result, it's you know more expensive to implement something like that. And without that kind of fallback of a human being able to look at the conversational history or um, really give you the... Um, really understand the intent behind the question, then you're going to have like a poor user experience. And so to that end, it's, I think, a concierge um, right now. Um, so thank you, thank you, Esther, for, yeah. for, for joining me here. <laughs> yes. Happy to. And thanks, up. everybody, for coming. <laughs>